So we have, I think, like 45 slides, three demos, and two people uh, in 35 minutes. So I think we need to just jump on into it and uh, keep the pace going pretty quickly. We're going to try to make sure that there's time at the end for questions also, uh, because typically with these sessions, we've had lots and lots of questions. So we want to make sure that there's time for that too. Um, so yeah, so this is the cross plane projects uh, introduction session and deep dive session. So it's you know kind of a combined thing, which is always interesting because we get to cover the full spectrum of cross plane stuff. But um, you know, for people that are already already familiar with it, there's kind of some introductory material you may have heard a few times by now. And then folks that are new on their cross plane journey might get a little lost later on. But we'll try to keep everybody all together through this whole thing. So my name is Jared, uh, one of the creators of the cross plane project, and I have my uh, my friend here, Chris uh, Christopher, who's a prolific uh, maintainer on the project as well. All right. So introductory material. Let's talk about what cross plane actually is. And the best way to think about it is that it is a framework uh, in order to help you build a cloud native control plane. Uh, so, you know, we talk about control planes, you know, cloud providers have been managing their infrastructure with control planes for years and years, right? That's not a new concept itself, but we wanted to be able to, uh, you know, create a framework so that all of you could build your own control planes to manage your infrastructure and your resources, et cetera, and inject your own opinions into it as well, um, you know, and have a nice framework to do that with. So kind of think about the top and the bottom of the Crossplane project. So on the bottom here, there is, um, you know, you can manage any type of infrastructure. Um, it's uh, very extensible there. Um, so you can talk to any cloud providers, on-premises stuff. Uh, it's very extensible. And on the front end, you can, you know, bring together those resources and kind of declare your own platform APIs, your own infrastructure APIs. So highly extensible on the, both the front and the bottom. So just a quick history about the project. So this is the CNCF project, right? That's why we have this maintainer track talk. Um, and we're looking at it as a neutral place for companies and you know, organizations, uh, individuals, et cetera, to all come together and work on you know, this mission of enabling cloud native control planes. So we've been doing this for a little bit. We started this project. The first code was written back in 2018. So it's been a good uh, you know, four, four years or so plus. Um, we donated it to the CNCF, though, in 2020. We got to a 1.0 milestone later that year. We are now at the incubating stage of the, of the CNCF. We've got a 1.12 release coming out on Tuesday, so just a few more days until that comes out, and there's some exciting stuff in that. And then we are hoping to continue progressing towards a full graduated status with the CNCF, uh, hopefully later this year. So there's definitely some help that we could use from folks that are using the project, successfully getting it in production, and sharing your story with us uh, in the adopters file. So just some numbers, project still continues to grow. Um, you know, people are starring it, people are contributing to it. The, my favorite uh, stat of the whole thing though is the top right one, where you know, over 1,500 people have contributed to the project in some way now. Uh, you know, that's pill requests, that's issues, that's you know, all sorts of things of many people coming together with this mission of cloud native control planes, right? So I, I love that and that's my favorite stat by far. So I'm going to turn it over to Christopher here to get started with, you've got an introduction so far, but you probably still don't really know what Crossplane does from what I've said. So let's start at the bottom layer and let's work our way up. So um, let's talk first about the fundamental basics of Crossplane. Um, we have here something called managed resources, and this could be anything um, outside of a Kubernetes clusters if it has an API. So. Um, Let's um, have a first look in um, one of the providers we have in the ecosystem. It's uh, for AWS, and as you can see here, we can manage um, hundreds of objects outside of the Kubernetes cluster. So to mention a few, it's like networking, databases, uh, Kubernetes clusters, and um, we can manage them all in the Kubernetes way. And that's also the idea from Crossplane. Um, so have a look now. On the right side, you see um, the AWS console for a S3 bucket. And normally you have for a S3 bucket something like a region, you get a um, resource arm for the bucket, you have a creation date, and you also have something like a tag on your S3 bucket. And if you're looking now a little bit on the left side, um, this is a 100% Kubernetes resource um, a view from the S3 bucket. So you can see we have here the API version and the kind uh, for this S3 bucket, and we're also um, using the uh, versioning for our APIs. Um, we have also full metadata support for labels and annotations. And we have here um, the spec, and the spec is our um, 
our thing, um, how the um, object in the API looks like. So our special stanza here for Crossplane is the for provider section. And everything what is under for provider, we is shipping to the API. So if we're creating something, we using all the, um, the fields here and um, send it to the API. Um, this uh, for provider thing here is high fidelity. That means if a um, resource in a cloud provider has hundreds of um, configure things, um, then we have also hundreds of configuration options here um, in the YAML file. Um, and it's a two-way communication when we're talking here from Crossplane. That means um, if you're creating this bucket now in the API, then we have also um, return values from the API, and we are um, publishing these return values under the status at provider. And in the case of an S3 bucket, you can see here we get an ARM. And, um, we're updating this also in the um, reconciliation loops every time. What we're getting from the APIs, we're publishing here in the add status provider. Um, then we have um, something like events. So every time we are communicating with the API, um, we're saving the things in the events. So in this case, you can see it was successfully created, but you can also thinking about if the uh, authentication is not working in the API, then um, you get a message here. And the cool part is you can because it's Kubernetes, you can um, have all your uh, current um, tools you're using for Kubernetes um, adopted to the things here because events and so on, it's uh, the same like uh, normal um, resources in Kubernetes. So look a little bit deeper. Um, when we are installing our providers in the Kubernetes clusters, um, the first thing what happened is that Crossplane installed the CRDs in the clusters. And what happened then is, for example, if we want to apply a S3 bucket, then we have controllers for uh, groups of resources. And if we're applying on the left side now our um, S3 bucket in the Kubernetes cluster, then the S3 controller watches on the API server and gets the feedback that there is a new resource available in the cluster for S3 bucket and directly starts talking with the S3 um, API from AWS, and then um, it's thinking about, is the um, object currently available? So there's three bucket in the API. If it's not available, it starts directly creating um, the resource in the API. Um, if it's currently available on the AWS side, then we're calculating a difference and applying it and starting to manage it fully. So um, if, if we're looking a little bit more in our providers, um, in the internal stack, then on the very bottom level, what we're using here is Kubernetes runtime so that our, um, our provider or controller uh, can be run in the cluster. Um, and it's also taking care of all your things, um, what you're using like ingress, um, services, uh, local lenses in front of your services. And um, if you're programming with Kubernetes, then you have something called API machinery. So what we're using here very, very heavily is the custom resource definition and the open API spec, what we're using here. And the cool part here is that you can create your custom types in Kubernetes, and then it's acting like a normal resource in Kubernetes. You're knowing like kubectl, get, update, delete, everything is working uh, like with your normal resources. Then we have the controller runtime, so it helps us for the reconciliation part, so like um, create, update, delete events, and uh, the controller knows then what to do. And what we have here from the Crossplane community part is the Crossplane runtime. So because we're creating not um, resources only in the cluster, outside of the cluster, and for this we have here the create, update, and delete thing. And on top of the runtime, we have custom logic. This could be everything, yeah? Self-coded, um, um, create, update, and delete um, methods, but this could be also um, very, very automatic what we're providing in uh, the Crossplane ecosystem. Then, next. All right, so you know that's kind of showing the what I, I can kind of refer to as the bottom layer of Crossplane. Like you know, you can create infrastructure and cloud resources, etc., and Crossplane will go and make that happen out in the real world, right? But uh, that's still that's a control plane. But I think there's a lot more power that comes out of uh, Crossplane when you can start injecting your own opinions in, and you can start uh, building your own platform API, essentially. So the whole concept here is that you take a lot of those uh, managed resources um, that Christopher was referring to, you can kind of assemble those together and expose that as a higher level abstraction, uh, you know, kind of a self-service uh, infrastructure API, you can think about it. So a tangible uh, example here is going to be, um, what does it take to expose a workload cluster, an application cluster for your developers, let's say? 
And so you, you could, for example, take together GKE, a node pool, the networks, subnetworks, all these sort of things, um, you know, some, some roles, some security policies, blah, blah, blah. You can compose that all together and then offer that as a very simple cluster abstraction to your developers so they can self-service, you know, create a workload cluster if they needed one. This idea extends, you know, across the entire ecosystem of cloud provider resources. So it's, you know, not just about creating clusters and managing clusters, right? It's about databases, caches, uh, message queues, um, buckets, like all that sort of stuff there too, right? So this becomes a very powerful concept when you can, you know, essentially build your own opinionated cloud native platform. Um, you know, it, like we've seen before that that's, uh, it's, it's declarative, right? It's m mostly YAML configuration, right? You don't have to write any code, but we'll actually be showing a new demo today uh, in which you can inject code in to make it do more things, to make it more powerful. Um, so here's a little picture to kind of put a little visualization to what we're talking about. So if you work your way left to right in this diagram here, um, the developer is on the left, uh, you know, she's eating her popsicle and she's ready to kind of get ready to provision some infrastructure for herself. So, you know, she can create a simple, uh, you know, the simple abstraction from your platform API that you've defined for her. She can tune a couple of configuration knobs on it uh, and then, you know, underneath the covers, that's going to go to a composite resource in, you know, like what does that definition of that at runtime mean? Um, that could be a whole bunch of managed resources put together. So really, we're kind of going left to right of a simple API, and underneath the covers, this environment complexity, this policy, these guardrails, this configuration, et cetera, and a strong separation of concerns between the developer getting their infrastructure and you as a platform engineer that's kind of designed this platform for them. Um, you know, another tangible uh, uh, description here of, you know, developers, the inter interface they get is they want a small Postgres database. That's what they get. That's what they get access to. That's, that's all that's exposed at that layer. Underneath the covers, right, we've got a composition for AWS. We could have one for GCP. We could have, you know, a gold and a silver. It doesn't matter. There's multiple different compositions that you can uh, implement for one particular um, infrastructure API. And then we see here that that folds out into RDS, uh, parameter groups, the DB, security groups, all that sort of stuff. Um, so this is like, this is kind of what the YAML looks like here. We're not going to dive into every line of this, but you can think about, you know, it's time to define your infrastructure API. And so in Crossplane, you do that by creating a composite resource definition. So you're essentially in here defining, uh, you're saying, cool, I want to create a new Postgres uh, instance for, or sorry, a new Postgres API for my developers. And then you're going to go ahead and define the schema of it. This is the shape of that API. This is what the developers are allowed to configure, what they're allowed to set. And this is the API for your opinionated control plane that you're designing right now. Underneath the covers, you've got to say at runtime, what does it mean when a developer creates an instance of this uh, simple Postgres API I've given them? What does that actually mean? And then you can start specifying all the resources that, uh, that compose that API underneath the covers and you know, get more specific about it. And then, of course, you can provide a bunch of patches to it. You can take, you know, configuration values from the user. You can flow those down, apply them to the resources that you're composing together, and essentially, um, you know, have something that's configurable and influenceable by the developer who's, who's self-service creating this infrastructure, but it's still something that you as a platform engineer have designed and implemented, and you're taking their, their, their configuration values and you're flowing it in, but it's still, you know, they're not, you're not giving them direct access to the cloud provider APIs. You're not letting them do whatever they want. It's by the guardrails that you're setting down. So, um, you know, we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, we've talked about Crossplane as a framework, right? And so there's m multiple different ways to extend Crossplane. So we can think about different extension mechanisms. So we've, you know, providers are a way to teach Crossplane new tricks of how to configure, provision, manage various resources in various different environments, cloud, on-premises, whatever. So we call those providers. And li literally, like, um, like Christopher was saying, anything that has an API, you can write a Crossplane provider for it. There's a pretty rich ecosystem of them right now. Um, but, you know, the community is out there and building more. Uh, you know, every week we see more providers. So that's, that's one extension point. And then when you are declaring and building your cloud native control plane, your opinionated platform, you can package those up into a set of what we call a configuration in Crossplane. It's essentially a bundle, a package of your infrastructure APIs into a reusable, you know, publishable, deployable unit. So that's, the, that's a good way to think about extending Crossplane. So within the ecosystem, you know, there's, there's a number of logos on there for providers that we have and that, that continues to grow every day. But uh, I think a big takeaway here is that 
if there are scenarios that are important to you all or environments or you know providers or whatever that you want to cross plane to be able to support then you know this this community does kind of listen to that and when people can rally around an idea or rally around a scenario or a use case for cross plane we see new providers pop up and spring up out of that so we have a nice neutral home to collaborate on all that together and then there's also a place to you know, visualize and see and discover and share all these. So there's a marketplace around this as well uh, for, you know, essentially publishing your providers and extensions and crossplane and, and, you know, rally around those as well. All right, cool. So that's a lot of stuff that we've covered before. So now we're gonna start diving into stuff that we have not seen before. So this is all like new functionality that has not existed at a previous KubeCon before. So I'm pretty excited about this stuff. Uh, so this kind of guess is more or less the start of the deep dive session. All right, so we just talked about compositions. It's a very, very powerful concept in Crossplane. And you know, we saw what it looks like that, for instance, you, know, you want to expose a simple database uh, object or API to your developers, and you'll let them configure uh, how many gigabytes of storage is it going to have backing it. And that's really all you're going to let them do, right? You're not exposing the environment complexity underneath. You're not allowing them to do anything more complicated than that. You're exposing to them a simple API. Underneath the covers, this, you know, you can specify a set of resources. You can specify how information and config value from the user flows down as patches. Um, but that's been somewhat limiting so far, right? We've had composition in Crossplane for a while, but there are most certainly use cases that it does not cover. So if we think about what are the limitations of composition today in Crossplane, well, you can't do complicated logic stuff, right? There's no flow control, there's no conditionals, it's, it's you know, there's no advanced, um, there's no advanced uh, programming uh, features, let's say, right? Like the list of resources that you're composing together is static, there's, there's no real variability to it. Um, and also you can't get real runtime information that would influence the, these, these resources that you're composing together. Uh, basically, patching and you know transforming and whatnot in composition in crossplane it's not a programming language right we we consciously did not want to grow a complicated dsl that's that's you know expressed in yaml um they would, you would have to reinvent a lot of things around that and tooling and um you know to make that work out well it would be have to, it would need to be very consciously designed with all this functionality in place and i don't think that's the right place in crossplane specifically so to solve this problem in Crossplane, we've introduced the concept of composition functions. So this was as of v1.11, which is in January. Uh, it was released as an alpha feature. And uh, so it's, it's, it's now available. You can start using it. Um, and the feedback we can get right now is really important as well as we continue to mature it. But essentially, what you can do instead of ex like statically defining these resources that you want to compose and you know, how you want to apply configuration to them, you can instead uh, specify a pipeline of functions to, to run, of actual code that you write. So any logic that you want to include for your use case is now on the table. Um, you know, there's no limitations about what language to write it in. That doesn't matter as long as you can receive you know, a, a function IO object and do some manipulations and write it back out. That's all you need. So you can do Python, Go, JavaScript, whatever. Um, this opens up the possibilities to do a lot of new things in Crossplane that you have not been able to do before. Um, and we're trying, we're trying to find the sweet spot between declarative, no code, you can build your opinionated platform with Crossplane without ever writing any code. Um, we're trying to find a sweet spot between that and you know, building and rolling an entire controller and writing you know, Kubernetes client code and reconciliation logic and all that stuff, right? So we're trying to find a sweet spot there. So what this ends up looking like is that you know, we've had compositions before, and then that was a set of resources that we're composing together in the patching and transforming logic. But now in addition to that, you can still do that, but now also you can specify what functions do you want to execute over these, over these resources? Uh, what code do you want to call? So for instance, we have a function section here that uh, you know, calls my cool function. And then that'll go do something, it'll manipulate the resources at runtime and give them back to Crossplane to go make it happen. 
A uh, quick architecture diagram, basically this whole thing runs as a sidecar uh, container to the main crossplane container inside the crossplane pod. And then the main crossplane container speaks over gRPC to the function runner container. And inside that, uh, the default implementation uh, of the crossplane function runner will invoke uh, a set of rootless function containers to execute your code and in a series of pipeline, pass them along to each other, continuing to manip manipulate the, the data. So that's what it's, uh, the architecture looks like. But then let's see some running code now and see what this looks like here in, in action. So I need to make some things bigger on my screen. I recognize that. Uh, so let's just start making text bigger. And uh, and let's also look at here. Let's make that a little bit bigger too. OK. So. We're going to look at an example here where we, uh, you know, a, this is a classic example that comes up in Crossplane all the time where somebody's like, okay, I have an abstraction that I want to give to my developers, uh, and underneath the covers, I want to create a variable number of resources. I do not know what, how many resources that I'm going to create until at runtime the user tells me to. So we're basically looking at a simple claim here for a robot group. Uh, this is a fake thing. It's not real, right? There's no, uh, maybe AWS made a robot group service. I'm not sure. But it's not real. It's an example of uh, somebody, you know, your developer saying, cool, I want to make a robot group, which is a group of robots, and I want five robots. Please give me five robots. Before in, cross, in composition of Crossplane, you, you can't do that. You, you just can't have, it's a static list. You can't have a variable number of these resources, right? So we hear about this all the time, uh, you know, for loops and conditionals, like if this, then create the resource. We hear about that all the time. So let's see that actually in action now. Um, let's go back to our prompts, and I think we still need to make this a little bit bigger, probably. And uh, let's just see. So I want to uh, apply the, comp the composite resource definition. I want to apply the composition as well. And let's see what that composition actually is. We look at the composition. And it's similar to the example I showed before of when we see a robot group being uh, created, what we're going to do is we're not going to have any resources we're defining. What we're actually going to do is we're going to invoke a function. We're going to call this, uh, this um, XFN mini function is what I've called it. We're going to call this function here to create the number, variable number of robots uh, that the users asked for, essentially. So let me refer to my notes real quick. This is not for you all to see, so don't worry about how small it is. But yep, okay, let's go ahead and uh, create an instance of that robot group that said, what did it say? It said five robots or something like that, I think it was, right? So what should happen right now is that the composition machinery should kick in. It should look at the composition. It should see what function to run. It should invoke that con the function within that container. That logic within the container should run. It should create the, these resources uh, in a variable length and hopefully, uh, we have a number of or five robots, I guess, created now, which we do, which is great. So our code executed, and we also have some other logic in there that randomly assigns values to them as well, just to show like, hey, you can do a lot of things in the programming there. So we have, each robot has a different color, which is very nice. Now, I don't think folks would, appre would appreciate how happy I am that this worked, because I don't know if any of you all have hit the Docker Hub rate limiting issues with everybody. Yes, you do feel that. So this worked at home when I built it like at 1 a.m. last night. Here, here in, the, in the conference center, it didn't work 30 minutes ago. So uh, <laughs> this <laughs> So all that to say, this talk brought to you by ExpressVPN. <laughs> all right, so that is working. That's great. Uh, let's look at one more thing. Uh, do, 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 is what does that code look like, right? We, we did something cool, um, so it's, it's a little cluttered here, sorry about that. But essentially, in our main function here, I've written some Go code where I read in the incoming crossplanes telling me, hey, the user wants you to do this, so I read the function I.O. I go ahead and say, okay, there's some observed stuff, there's some desired stuff. Right now, there's no observed robots. We're starting at zero, so I make sure that any robots that exist, or we account for them. And then for how many robots you've asked, we go ahead and generate those robots, we create those uh, definitions for them, and then we write that I.O. back to Crossplane to make it happen. So it's a fairly streamlined sort of thing. Read it in, figure out what to do, write it back out to Crossplane, and let Crossplane do all the, uh, all the heavy lifting there. Um, so I, let me get back to the slides, and I think that's it. I'll pass it back to Christopher on the other laptop here. 
going to use my power. There you go. Okay. So, yeah, cool. Let's talk about another feature um, uh, for the cross plan community. It's observe only resources. So, in the past, we had uh, in, the, in the community a lot of um, questions regarding data source support, like uh, the guys in Terraform have, or how they can adopt um, their legacy um, deployed objects from the APIs uh, to cross plan. And um, it was hard because um, you need to know the external name, like the identifier, and you needed to add um, all the required names also from the, uh, from the resource you want to import. Otherwise, it was not possible to import the resources. So we shipped a new feature as alpha for um, some of the providers. And the cool part here now is that uh, the provider um, will observe existing resources without taking the ownership of it, which means um, you can import it and all the uh, fields will be displayed under the um, status, what I showed previously. Um, because it's an alpha feature, it's uh, currently only available if you're passing the enable management policy um, to the controller config and start the provider with this. Um, and after that, um, we're doing a few things under the hood for the um, CRDs we have in the providers. So we're using um, CRD validation rules that we can create managed resources without providing all the required fields. Um, we're using their cell validation um, from Google um, in the CRDs. And regarding this, we have a few API changes we want to introduce uh, in the providers if they are, want to have support for observe-only resources. So we introduced a new spec manage policy. And with this management policy, we have now three new options, or uh, like adoption from the old ones, but we have full control. So to, um, this is the behavior we have today if you're running the um, resources. We have often on the lead, which is uh, today the same like uh, in the deletion policy, the often, and then we have observe only. Um, what we also want to change now is um, we have the full state um, under status at provider, which means this is now a superset of um, spec for provider. So we are displaying all the possible um, attributes under the um, status, and then you, then you, then you see um, how easy it is to observe the resources and perhaps also changing after observe only mode to something like full control that you start to manage this resource also. And in the future, we also want to um, start deprecating the spec deletion policy. So for now, um, we're adding the management policy uh, to, the, to the spec and have also the deletion policies. So there is something like a table available at the moment in the design document. What does it mean if you're setting full control and management policy and setting a deletion policy to often or delete? There's a few things um, you need to check at the moment. And in the future, we want to um, remove then the deletion policy on it. Um, so, how it looks like now. Um, for a VPC, so thinking about uh, your network team providing you the VPC and you, don't, you, you can't manage it, but you want to observe it that you can use um, fields from the VPC for other resources you have in your compositions. So you need to um, set an external name now, set uh, under spec the management policy to observe only, and the only thing you need under for provider is the region, so in this case US East 1 and then the provider starts uh, to observe only the resource. And at the end, it looks like this. You see, at the status at provider, you get now all the uh, information from the resource, like CIDR block, DNS host names, support, whatever. And um, yeah, that's quite awesome and helps a lot of people, I hope, um, to adopting to crossplan. Let's see this very short um, hands-on. So um, you can see here the controller config part, what I was talking about, enable management policy. Um, we're configuring then in the provider the controller config. And on the VPC side, you see here I have a very easy VPC. I have a label here, an annotation to an existing VPC in the AWS account, setting the management policy to observe uh, only. And I have here um, the region to EU Central 1 in this case. So then. Um, create um, this VPC. We can describe this VPC 
And if my internet is working, then you see now there's all the fields now for this um, observe only VPC. So there's nothing on the spec for provider, but um, all the fields we get them back from the AWS API is now available. And you see it's a lot of things. Um, at the moment, if you want to change now from the observe only mode to full control, you need to copy pasting the status at provider things to for provider. There is an enhancement issue open that we um, want to want to change it then um, if it comes from alpha to beta or general available feature that the provider will dust this automatically for you if you're changing the uh, management policy. Cool. Um, this is um, everything now for the um, observe only um, feature we shipped in one of the providers. So, and there's one other topic uh, in the community. So like um, I need metrics to observe my resources. Um, what I have in the cluster. So thinking about, um, we have in cross-plane like cross-plane core, we have the providers, we have compositions, we have um, claims, like everything like this. And normally guys asking in the community like, so um, how you can um, enable um, observability tools like Prometheus Grafana to see the status of all the objects um, in the systems. So um, we had one idea in the community, um, building something similar to CubeStat metrics, but the problem in CubeStat metrics was that you need to configure CubeStat metrics for um, all the resources you want to have then there and um, observed. You need to configure it and it's very hard because you have the providers, you have the compositions and so on. So what we built up here is a service called Xmetrics. We will publish this right after the talk because um, I had no access to this. But uh, in general, um, we have an endpoint for the metrics then available. Um, we're doing something like a state snapshot uh, during the uh, Kubernetes API. And then we have a few options. So like we're getting all the information from compositions, from managed resources on the cluster level. And on the claim level, they are namespaced. And we're getting also the information like last transition time, um, creation time, um, also, the, the, um, if it's ready, true, zinc, true, something like this. And how does it look like? We have uh, CRD support for this. So like in this case, for a cluster uh, resource, we have a cluster metric here. And under spec for match name, we have a string. Um, it has regex support. And in this case here, um, we want to configure for our VPC. We imported now um, the metrics. So it's VPCs, EC2, AWS, upbound IO. And what happens afterwards is um, all the metrics are available then in your Prometheus, for example, and you can also start building um, dashboards out of it in Grafana. So let's have a look how it looks like as a uh, demo. So we have here, as I said, the cluster metrics, and we want to apply this now uh, in our cluster. So like... So you see now this resource is created in the cluster. We're switching now to my web browser and you can see automatically now a Prometheus endpoint is available for this metrics part. And you can see that the VPC we created for the observe only resource, um, we have now all the uh, metrics available. Like, is it synced? Is it available in the API? When is the last transition time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's also the case, it's easy to change, for example, now here the regex group. So say we want to see everything from EC2 group um, in our, in our um, X metrics. So we apply it again. It's configured now. And if you refresh it, you can see it's now um, giving you all the, um, the, the metrics you, you want to have from the EC2 group. It's also um, possible to uh, configure it like uh, categories from CRDs. So one of the popular um, category is, for example, managed in uh, Crossplane. So you can say, give me all the metrics from all the CRDs which matching, for example, the managed category, and then you get all the metrics uh, created. Yeah. Then. All right. 
Thanks, Christopher. So let's finish this off here. So uh, we've got two minutes. I think we might have let you down in terms of having a lot of time for questions. I apologize about that, but we'll be here to keep that chat right after too. Um, but anyway, so you know, we have built a community around Crossplane. Uh, a lot of you here in this room are participating in it. You are what ma is making this project awesome, right? You're contributing code, you're contributing feedback and issues and all that sort of stuff. So please continue doing so. There's lots of other ways to get involved um, as we continue to grow and scale the project. Um, and then I guess the final uh, call out here is, um, you know, we, as we're making our graduation proposal, we want to hear the stories from all of you that are adopting Crossplane right now. So you go to, to the main Crossplane, Crossplane repo, go to the adopters file, and there's instructions there for how you can share your story uh, and, and tell us uh, about how you're using Crossplane. So uh, that's that. I think that's everything. And then we'll take questions, maybe just one, because I think we've got one minute. All right. Awesome. First question. Yes. Oh, sorry. I'll do one. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, coming from Terraform, uh, you could detect dangerous operations using the plan. Maybe some change in the cloud object will uh, cause a recreation of the object. Maybe it's dangerous. So, is there anything like any kind of safeguard, a similar thing in crossplane that would prevent me from doing dangerous operations? Yeah, so, so typically, uh, you know, it depends on how the, the provider is, is implemented. Uh, but then a lot of the providers do have that same sort of safeguard uh, involved in them of, you know, if this is something that would, you know, potentially destroy the, the resource or something like that, then it, will, it won't do it, basically. But uh, essentially, though, um, you know, that's, that's not, yeah, not a very, very common thing. And then Crossplane tries to take a philosophy of never deleting your resources, you know, without you explicitly asking to do so. And that's a pretty okay, strong so, so philosophy. That provider level, like. Okay. Sorry, say that again? It's on a provider level. Yeah, like, exactly. And within the providers themselves, that logic of like, you know, the specific mechanics of that cloud fighter and its APIs and, and what's going to do changes and what's not. So, all right, so we'll be up here at the stage for a little bit too if anybody wants to come and chat. But thank you so much, everybody. Oh, that's yours.